Welcome everybody. My name is Mikey Mhenna, and today's talk is with the founder of Habibi Funk, Yanis. Uh, I don't remember, think I ever asked you how to pronounce your last name. Is it Sturtz? Is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, Yanis Sturtz is the German DJ behind Habibi Funk and has developed a name around the world of acquiring uh, of, for his work of acquiring rare singles and artists that shaped the sound of the 50s, 60s, and 70s in the MENA region. His trips take him to dusty stores from Morocco to Egypt, Lebanon to Sudan, on a mission to reinvigorate rare old vinyl records and tapes and present these pieces to the world on his label, Habibi Funk. Yanis, welcome to Africa Conversations. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm a huge fan of your work. Uh, a lot of people know that I am, uh, I'm a musician and I love music, um, but I did not know, all, I can very clearly say that I did not know one artist that you have featured on Habibi Funk before you featured them. And so my question to you is, how did you find any of these people? How did you first become exposed to these artists. I don't believe you grew up in the region. So how did you first become e exposed to them? Um, I guess there's no blueprint. Um, one way of finding music that I like, and I, we, we had a brief conversation about it on, on Instagram. Um, I don't think our focus is too much on rare records because rare always has that, has like weird connotations. Um, we are really just into music that we, and that is me and some people who are part of the team like. Um, I think there is no, rare music does not automatically make it great music. I guess I could record a hip hop album and press two copies of it and it would be considered rare because there's only two copies, but it would still not be something that anyone would want to listen to. Um, having said that, um, I mean, one, one place I usually, find music that I like is, is record shops or whatever um, works as the closest substitute to a record shop. I mean, there's a lot of places where you don't have a record shop per se, but you have like an antique shop or an old secondhand bookshop that has like two stacks of records, like the one you can just see. I think that's say, Yeah, that's in Medina. It looked different when I, I mean, I, I recognize the two posters that, 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 that <laughs> but the place looked different last time I was there. Anyhow, um, so I usually try to bring like a portable turntable um, and then I just listen to a lot of records. And at this point, um, I mean, I kind of have an idea whether a record is something that I'm interested in within like three seconds of listening. So I might go through like 500 records in, in, in like an afternoon. But, but there's also music, I've, I've, sorry, I, music that I've found on, on YouTube and uh, then uh -huh. Uh, YouTube was the starting point. So there, there's not really a blueprint. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because it's funny. Uh, the work you're doing is is decidedly analog, but it's it's also probably the most digital thing possible because so much of the work and so much of the exploration happens on YouTube and on you know SoundCloud and Bandcamp and all this stuff. Um, but I want to get to this photo. Um, there's a story that I've seen that you've told about 2012, going to Morocco and sort of diving into the, into the stacks and the crates at these types of record stores and discovering some music that you hadn't previously discovered. Um, tell, tell us a little bit of that story and sort of what you found and, and that, how that led to the first release at Have You Be Fun? Yeah, the, the, I mean, that was kind of the, the starting point. I was already, I studied political science, but while studying, I already was running a record label together with a school friend, which um, called Jakarta Records, and it's more like focused on hip hop music, instrumental stuff. Um, and one of the artists, um, a rapper from Ghana, um, played at a Moroccan festival called Mawazine, which is like the big Moroccan um, festival. And I came along doing tour management and I stayed a couple of days extra and I just like walked um, through Casablanca. And at some point I came across like a tiny shop in a side street um, that only had like stacks and stacks of old electronics that I guess his business was fixing them up um, and selling them. Um, 
and behind these stacks of broken electronics or semi-broken electronics, there were stacks and stacks of records. And it turned out um, that the owner of the shop used to be involved in uh, record distribution in the 1970s. Um, and I bought some records, and among them was one by a guy called Fadu. And I was, at this point, I didn't have a portable turntable yet, but I was immediately intrigued because he credited James Brown in the writing credits for the A side of the of the, of the seven inch, so the small record that only has two songs, one on each side. And it, when I was home, it turned out to be like a James Brown inspired song, but played with like a very wild energy. I, I mean, I'm not a musician, but even I could tell on some of the recordings, like the notes were not completely on point, like it was, it, a lot of the recording session of recording sessions of Fadu's music feel like the transporting and overall energy and feeling was prioritized over making the recording sound perfect in in a musical sense. But it, that is also something that made it very unique. And I guess because we were already running a record label, so we had an idea about distribution about PR and how like the general workaround of, of a record label works. Um, we kind of quickly came up with the idea of trying to re-release that music. Um, yeah. um, and at the same time, we made like a very conscious decision. Like at this point, I think it has, it has changed a bit, but back then there was also like a, still a lot of ratios where there were clearly like bootlegs, meaning they were not, the rights were not clear and the music was just pressed and put out. But we very uh, consciously made the decision that if we do it, we want to do it properly and license the music. Um, and that was like the starting point of, I think, like a two-year search of trying to find Fadul. And then within a year, learning that he had passed in the early 90s already. Um, and then eventually finding his family um, and um, doing, working on the release together with them. Um, yeah. So in between hearing Fadul and putting it out, it was roughly two years. Let's actually listen to a little bit of this. So this was recorded in 1971 in Morocco. Um, and this is a artist who most Moroccans uh, at the time were unaware of. Would you, would, is that safe to say? Yeah, I guess I, he's someone that you would consider an quote underground artist or specialist. Okay. Let's listen to a little bit of this. This, is, uh, this was released. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, it's uh, it it's dying for a Tarantino script to, <laughs> to be scored. Yeah, and actually, we there have been a few placements in, in movies and like yeah. Tarantino level, sadly, but the the, yeah. the level two steps below that. So, um, what is what is the reception by um, by Fadul's family or other? What was the reception in Morocco when this when this was first released in two thousand fifteen? So basically, I mean, we, we had this very long search of trying to find Fadul and then learning about his passing um, and trying to find the family. And eventually there, there, there was a guy called Tony Day, not his real name, but this is his, was his artist name, a Moroccan artist who never really released anything himself, but he was like the background singer for a lot of the bands of the day. And he was friends with Fadul and he actually lives in Germany now. And he told me he doesn't really have a contact with anyone anymore. But he remembered the part, the neighborhood in Casablanca that he used to live. And then we went there and literally like showed his album cover to people on the street and in like the coffee places. And eventually someone knew where his parents used to live, where passed at this point as well. And then one of the neighbors knew where his brother lives. And then we like randomly cold called the doorbell. 
and the, the brother's daughter opened up, so Fadul's niece. Um, and she was very surprised because she was born after her uncle had died. And she was like, the guy looks like my dad, but I know it's not him. And she knew she had an uncle she had never met, but she didn't even knew, know she, that he was a musician. Um, so the, the family was very happy. Um, but at the same time, you could also tell that when Fadul came home and was with his family, then he was the private person. I think they were not very involved in his artistic life. Um, so I think it came to them as a surprise because they clearly also hadn't heard the music in like 25 years. Yeah. But they were super happy and they were like, yeah, no, sure. Um, um, you have our blessing and they get a few photos that they had kept. Um, and, and, and that has overall, I don't even think we've ever been neither by an artist or in the case of an artist who's not around anymore by the estate of an artist. I don't think we've ever been turned down. And I still think in general, everyone was always very happy. Um, so uh, this- and I forgot the second part of your question. Uh, well, we'll come back to it in a second. So this was a, a full album. I have the track list up there. It has, I guess, nine songs or eight songs on it. Um, but the first Heavy B Funk release was a single um, from a group called Dalton, which is a, a Tunisian group that's around the late 60s, um, early 70s. I want to uh, play a little bit of it and then um, talk about how you came across this group and why this was really the first, the first release. <laughs> Stop it there. So, um, yeah, how did you come across this? Was this just another crate digging find, or at this point, were people? Why was this the first album, the first release, and how did you find this one? Because, and I guess that also goes to demystify our process of research, which sometimes can be two years and us randomly walking the streets, but yeah. it can also just be reading the name of the band leader, putting the name into Facebook and giving him a call on WhatsApp the next day, which was oh. uh, the case for Dalton. Uh, so Fauzi Shkili, the, the band leader, um, <laughs> he's in the mid seventies, but he's still very in tune with, with modern technology. And then you speak to him and he tells you that he just played a show with someone who also raps because he wants to keep in touch with the new sound. Um, so oh. we found out about this, seven inch much after maybe a year after for the but um things just moved much much quicker so it this became the first release because at this point like we had made up our minds that we would want to give it a shot to re-release um this music um and in this case it, the, the the clearing process was just much quicker um and the clearing process for those who are not really yeah. in the music about it. means that you get the rights to release the music. And um, what was always very important to us and what we've been like very vocal and transparent about is that all of our releases are licensed. We split the, the, process, the proceeds 50-50. Um, we don't own the music. Um, so let's say a lot of major labels own the music. Um, for indie labels, it's 50-50. But basically, we don't own the music. We only get a license that is limited by time. So after our term runs out, the rights to the music go back um, to the artist or the artist's family. Um, and um, in, obviously, in order to do that, we need to find the artist or we need to find the artist's families. Or sometimes, in, in, in the cases, 
where the music has been released on record labels that are still in business and still active. We also once in a while license from, from record labels or the companies that represent the rights of, of, of the yeah. original. Is your experience that most of the labels from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, are they still around? Are they, were they, were any of them not signed to labels and they just recorded them in the studio and they own the masters or? Daltal, for example, was a privately pressed one. Daltal was a band that essentially was like a hotel club band. Yeah. Um, and then they took the money and went uh, to Italy and recorded two songs and that, I guess, reflected a bit more of what they would have loved to play uh, if being put in a position where they would have needed to compromise less uh, with regards to sound. Um, yeah. But it's a mixed bag. Um, a lot of the labels of the music that we deal with are not around anymore. But I think that's also a statement you can't generalize because the music we are into is by no means a fair representation of, let's say, the musical scene of Casablanca. Fadul is not there. I mean, we are mainly into very special interest niche sounds, which is essentially a continuation of what we've been doing at Jakarta Records. And I guess the more special and special interest the sound is and the labels that put it out the more these labels also are likely to not be around anymore. Um, the labels that put out the big commercial successes of the 1970s in Lebanon or in Cairo, they are probably still around, or at least there's companies that represent their catalog. Um, so yeah, it, it really depends a bit on the type of, of sound um, yeah. that, that you're at. So I want to keep on going and try to get through as much of this as possible. I, this may mean that I have to cut you off a bunch, but I want to try to show a bunch of the sounds. So in 2016, there were two releases. One that I felt like was kind of a, a curveball, um, which is the Ahmad Madik one, um, which I'll play a little bit of. He's an Algerian musician who was a conductor, composer, and this is, it's almost sort of like, it's very cinematic. Um, and then the other one's Carthago, um, which is kind of this like, Dalton fusion. So let's listen to Carthago since Dalton's still in our head. Um, and we'll go from there. This is a Okay, cool. Um, and then listen to Ahmed uh, Malik because I'm curious how these also came about and what because uh, this one's. Ahmed Malik sounds like like 1930s, like Duke Ellington <laughs> style stuff. It's a, it's a bit later, it's like 1960s, 1970s. And he's the classic musician, and I guess he has the classic face of soundtrack composers that more people know their work than they know their name. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's any different for the average Hollywood composer. Totally. Uh, he did the soundtrack. Sorry, let me uh, try to kill my email program. Um, 
yeah, sorry, no, I'm, I'm, I'm at risk of killing my, sorry. Um, and um, so he made the soundtracks to a lot of Algerian movies in the 1970s, 1960s. So a lot of people remember some of the themes, some of the melodies, but probably less people know his name. Um, but we've been in, in love with the music ever since we heard it. It always has like a fair share of like melancholia and beauty, I guess. Yeah. Um, and in his case, like the, the story of how we found his family was one of the biggest coincidences we've come across, basically, I told a friend of mine, I had a DJ gig in Beirut, I told a friend of mine that I loved his music so much, and I, but I had tried to find a family and had no luck, and I know other people had tried as well, and she told me, well, I have this one friend from, from Algiers, so I'll ask her, and I'm like, yeah, sure, but there's like, I don't know how many people live in Algiers, probably more than a million. Um, so I was like, I'm not going to get my hopes up, and it turned out that this friend's family is living in the same building as Amy, Ahmed Malik's daughter. Um, and um, his daughter is always convinced that her dad made it happen from heaven. And I guess um, I, I, can't, I can't argue against that. And with Ahmed Malik, that's also one of the, the artists we've, where we've put out the second album and we've done a lot of work, which always has been important to us to contextualize the work. So ideally, not have me talk about the music or someone from our team, how they feel about it, but people who are close to the music. So um, ideally the artist, or if the artist is not around anymore, people who knew the artist and were around. Um, so Paloma Colomb, who's a friend of ours, who's a uh, fellow DJ, but also a filmmaker, she produced a short documentary about Ahmed Malik. And we also uh, produced an exhibition in Algiers about his life, his work in the in the MAMA, the National Museum of Modern Art, in Algiers, which is like a beautiful building, and we were super privileged and happy for them to have us. Um, and hopefully, we can bring this exhibition also to other places now, like Corona. Fingers crossed, is maybe yeah. coming, coming to an end. But uh, it was also important for us to bring that exhibition to Algiers first, and then from there bring it to other places. Cool. And, uh, and yeah, sorry, and Dal uh, Carpago is, as you said, it's like an offshoot of Dalton. Um, maybe some people realize that it's actually the same song played in two different styles. So um, I think Carpago was like six or seven years later, and disco became a thing at this point. So they recorded like a disco version of the same song after they had fused with a band called Mahabal Band, and two bands became one band because one band didn't have a horn section that the other one. Mm. Um, so the band became twice as big um, and yeah, tried to like adapt to the, the new sound that was coming up. Um, and that was the result of it. Okay, I'm gonna keep it moving. Hopefully there'll be more questions in the chat about this. Um, of all the releases, I was really interested in the electronic tapes um, because this is a little different. This is not just a, a release, a re-release. Um, tell the story of how the idea of this uh, project came about and the sort of the, the, the drawer of, of tapes that, that you were given. And so give us a, a little background about that release. Yeah, I mean, basically, after we put out the first album by Hemanmatic, we visited Hemia, his daughter, in, in, in Algiers. And we had met her, and towards the end of our second time of getting together, she was like, oh, and I still have this box of like old big tapes, but I'm sure you wouldn't need them, right? And basically when you deal with source material for music, there's this priorities or the ideal scenarios. Um, worst case, you have an actual cassette tape and you try to improve the sound and produce the music or remaster the music of that final record is usually preferable because it, it stands the test of time much better but in the ideal scenario you have master tapes which is the format that a musician gets when he or she goes to the recording studio and the engineer at the end of the session gives the music on that on that big tape and this is what she had so there was maybe 40 tapes of her dad's music and among them, 
um, was ambient early dabbling with electronic music, which is something he became interested in in the late 70s. Um, and he started visiting this music festival in Cuba that was dedicated to like electronic music. Um, and electronic music, not necessarily the way how you would consider electronic music today. So it's not like techno music, but it's more like ambient music, I would say, I would call it, if you try to put a contemporary term on it. Um, but at the same time, a lot of it was like demos, quick ideas that were clearly not finished. Um, and around this time, I had a conversation with a producer called Flacco, who lives in Berlin, and he's really into ambient music. And he was super excited about it. And we kind of had the idea that, it would, that somehow the music is, is the way it was on these tapes is probably not something you could put out. Um, but at the same time, we, would, we didn't want to do like a, a classic remix project where you just take like a small theme and turn it into like a club house music track. Um, so I think the approach that Flaco took was to finish the album in a way that one could envision Ahmed Malik would have finished it if he himself would have. Yeah. Um, which is something that is obviously only something like where you can try to get close to it. Um, and it's an attempt at doing something. Um, but I think it, I mean, the, the music is clearly still less accessible than a lot of the other music we put out. It, uh, it's very avant-garde, I yeah. guess. Um, but yeah, um, I, I think the people who are into that music uh, really enjoyed it and we were happy to put it out. Yeah, it was a, I think it's a really ambitious project to take on. Okay, I'm gonna uh, keep on going. Um, and I wanna take a break from the music to talk about terminology. Um, when you, when the sort of standard line of a, um, Habibi Funk, when you look on your Instagram page is, you know, it's exploration and sort of re-releasing eclectic music from the fifties, sixties and seventies. And eclectic is one of those terms that just like kind of means nothing and means that can mean anything. Um, I was reading an interview that you gave and you were saying, you know, some where you're trying to wrestle with this idea of how to describe all this music. And you said some of our favorite records are best described as Arabic Zouk, you know, um, or like Algerian Kole, Kole Dera or Lebanese AOR. These are terms that I haven't heard before. Um, but what I liked is that you were saying stuff that it's basically music from the region that's, that's uh, taking Western music as a blueprint and translating it with a local accent. Um, this, this quote was from a few years ago. Um, has your sort of terminology evolved over the last few years as you've gotten deeper and deeper and deeper and more exposed to the music? Is there a better term to use that you think might encompass the work, the music that you are releasing? I mean, I think there, 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 there's a few aspects to it. Um, the fact that you don't know these genres, I guess, means it's niche genres. Um, obviously, Coladera music is super popular on, popular on the Cap Verdean Islands or Zouk in the French Caribbean, but it's probably not genres that necessarily had a global success. Um, yeah. But like, for example, in these cases, it, is, it was musicians who visited Paris and who might have heard a record from, from, from someone from, from a Caribbean island and kind of tried to adapt, adopt that. Um, I think what has changed um, moving on is that we are still interested, I guess, in general in music that attempts to bring together different influences. Um, but I think what we have moved away from, not necessarily consciously, but it just happened that way, is someone like Fadul who took like, who, and, and, like adapted, like, let's say what James Brown was doing. Yeah. For example, when we started re-releasing music from Sudan, Western, quote unquote, Western influences became far less relevant. Um, let's say for, for someone like Kamakela, sure, James Brown was someone you probably listened to, 
but he listened to Congolese music, Ethiopian music the same way. So I think um, the, the influences have become much wider than just being takes on disco or funk. Um, um, and the, the, the places, um, the, the musicians we work with or whose material we work with have, that they draw inspiration from have become wider and more versatile. Um, but what we obviously still always struggle with is that if you have a headline, if you have a hype text, if you have a sticker, if you're trying to promote a record, you're always going to reduce complexity. I mean, yeah, just essentially the fact that we have a compilation that deals with music from the Arab world, and then the next release we're putting out is by an Amazia artist uh, who would probably not identify themselves as first and foremost Arab, but as an Amazia. So, um, and I think we're always trying to navigate um, the necessity of working with a limited word count and at the same time trying to add some hints of the actual complexity in the booklet, in the more detailed write-ups we do, um, which is, which is a, a tight space. And I'm sure sometimes yeah. we also fail at trying to do that. Uh, um, and I mean, in the end, also if you, once you deal with press and you deal with media, you also realize that oftentimes like complexity is not necessarily something that media is actively looking for because they are dealing with the same issue of having limited space. But yeah, it's something we're, we're trying, we're trying to, to do the best possible. Yeah. Um, One of the things I'll say that I really appreciate uh, about your work um, is that, that you're trying and it, the easiest way to easiest way to see this is to go through the liner notes of all these albums, which you can read on Bandcamp. And you guys spend a lot of effort, you know, writing um, writing the stories and sort of how the how you got to each album and, and how you're sort of working through all this stuff. So um, I, uh, that is very evident and very appreciated. Let's actually take a, a listen to the first album that you guys released uh, from a Sudanese musician. Um, this is the eighth release. So I think, would you say that the, of the of the albums released this thus far, that this was the first one where the artist was hugely popular, um, and it, I, I think he's he was very popular at the time. Um, or not, not so much. I mean, now I. I, he, he, I mean, people knew him, but he was not Wildy or any of the the big big names of Sudan. I mean, there's he he. So in Sudan, they, they call this genre, uh, like he, was, he was one of the Sudanese jazz musicians. Yeah. Um, and this is, that, that is a genre that this 
a group of Sudanese musicians uses themselves. Um, and I guess it's always a bit of a misunderstanding because it, for, for when, when it hits people from outside of Sudan, because it doesn't really sound like classical jazz as the American musical genre. Um, but it's, it's, it's the wording they came up with, which usually is like a blend of like Congolese music, Sudanese traditional music, but also Afro-American influences. Um, and these artists had like their definitive niche, um, but I think they were also struggling with not necessarily being overly supported. Um, and and that's also a too general statement because it changes during the different political governments and regimes in, in, in Sudan. But if you look at whether the majority of these artists, for example, were able to release music on Sudanese labels, um, you would see that apart from Shahabil, they couldn't because the music industry was not so much looking for them. Yeah. Um, so you have bands like the Scorpions, whose cover we, we can see right now, who went to Kuwait to release their music there. Or you have people like Amal Kela, who um, recorded for Sudanese radio which is something that was an option and allowed a lot of artists to record because there is a difference in Sudanese copyright which does not allow radio stations to play recorded music from the labels um, yeah. because there is no system that would compensate this, um, which you have in most other countries. So all of the radio stations recorded their own musical repertoire so they had music to play. Um, and the Kamakela album is one of these sessions um, from 92, and he luckily kept a, a real copy of it all of these years. Um, wow. So a lot of these Sudanese jazz bands mainly had their music being recorded um, for, 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 for the radio. Um, and the scene was, was very vital. There was probably like 20, 30 bands um, of which I've only like found recordings of maybe one third of them, but I'm sure in the archive of the Sudanese radio, there's much more. Um, but all of these bands career kind of came to a halt when, when the regime change came in the late eighties and they didn't take over. Yeah. Um, I mean, some of them, it was not like, it, it was more gray zone. It was not like they were forbidden to play. Um, but I think for a lot of them that they there are venues where they would classically perform, like nightclubs, bars, hotel lobbies. These places kind of cease to exist or at least stop putting on live music. Um, so I think it was a mixture of like political and cultural pressure mixed with the economic pressure of just not being able to sustain themselves. So are you... Well, sorry, the, the scene kind of dies down. So um, under, just talking about the, the sort of the 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 role of Habibi uh, Funk as a, a, a label and sort of the opportunity set from 2012 to now it's you know from 2012 when you first started thinking about this stuff to now it's been 10 years um, you've had you know 17 releases since then uh, I think that's the number um, at that point you you know you were looking people up on Facebook <laughs> asking them hey can can we have access to this. Has it shifted such that, such that now you're getting calls from family members of sort of off the beaten path groups saying, I want you to release my, uh, my uncle or my aunt's album, here it is. Are, are other record uh, labels reaching out to you saying, here is our entire portfolio, re-release it so that we can get revenue? We've had a little bit, um... Some of the Egyptian labels that are still around, that are still like actively putting their, their catalog on Spotify, they have seen that we've done a good job in revitalizing some old material and they, they are kind of keen on working with us. Um, it, but it, that doesn't happen too often. I mean, what has definitely changed is that if you do the work and you kind of, manage to um, do right by the artists, approach the, their works 
uh, respectfully, keep them involved, that they will get that word out within their community. Um, so it becomes much easier to get in touch with artists after that. And I think you, you're kind of already trusted a bit more than if you're coming out of nowhere. And I think this is, yeah. this is something that has happened. Yeah. Um, or you have someone like, for example, Roger's album, the, the, the last one we put out, it came because one of the artists we had worked with before was like, oh, you got to check out my friend. Um, yeah. And you should listen to it. And matter of fact, I still have one of his tapes in my basement. Take it and listen to it. So I think that is, um, we, we don't really have like these cold calls of someone like randomly getting in touch with us, but um, you can tell that we're kind of building like this, this little community. I mean, there, there was this very nice moment where uh, one of our colleagues in Sudan, um, basically we, we had to pay royalties to the three artists um, that, whose music we've put out from Sudan so far. So she went to the first band and that band, after they, we had done like the, the payment thing, they joined for meeting the second band and then they all came along to meet the third band. And in, in the end, there was like 20 people hanging out together um, oh. and some of which hadn't seen one another for quite some time. And like, this is nice to see that it, it kind of also, um, yeah, helps to connect some artists with one another who might not call one another every day, but who will recommend their friends work to us um, because they feel like this is something we might as well be interested in. So I'm gonna ask you a final question then move to a quick Q&A and then open it up to the questions. So I could imagine that the first time you started working on this, there is sort of a knee jerk cynicism or knee jerk sort of pullback from folks, right? German DJ in Morocco, looking through crates, saying, hey, hey, give me, give me uh, the rights to, re to your music. I'll take care of you, right? It, it sort of triggers a bunch of cultural appropriation uh, allergies. How do you think you've sort of won trust over, over the last decade? And how do you even like deal with uh, your internal understanding of what is a very, very sensitive, uh, you know, sensitive business? Yeah, I mean, I think essentially this is a, this would be enough material for a whole separate conversation. But, yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I think one thing that is important is to stay open for criticism. Um, and in the end, you might think about an, an aspect that someone brings to your attention or critique and decide that, no, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable comfortable with how we do it and we keep on doing it. But I think what also has happened in the last 10 years is that we've changed our ways. Um, let's say that like the one example that always comes to mind, like I come from like this background of going to the flea market in the early morning and looking for records, even before Habibi Funk was a thing and I was looking for like proud rock records or whatever. And in that like scene of like record collectors or whatever you want to call them, it's super common to say, I found this, uh, sorry, I discovered this record. When you talk about a record that not, not many people have on their radar. Um, so I kept on using that wording. And then at some point, uh, someone pointed out to me that it's problematic if I use that wording as a white dude talking about uh, non-European uh, non music, because it has that, it feels a bit Christopher Columbus-ish. Yeah, I discovered the, the new world. Yeah, and I thought about it and it made total sense. Obviously, I never discovered Fadu. There was plenty of people in Morocco that remembered him and that had yeah. records. So I was like, yeah, let me not use that word anymore. Um, and I think it, or for example, like that we, one of our colleagues, like um, uh, Malik, who's, who lives, who's an Egyptian and she works from Cairo remotely, like one to two days a week. At some point was like, yeah, yeah, at this point, the, the, the channel has a reach. Uh, we would really need to make sure it's bilingual. And I was like, yeah, sure, let's start doing it. Um, and I think it's important to keep on keep an open ear, um, which doesn't mean that there's people who, who dislike Habibi Funk for the fact that it is like 
started by someone who's from outside. And no matter of how we do it, they are still going to dislike it just because of the concept. And this is something I, I have to accept and, um, and, um, and that is okay too. Um, but um, yeah, I think in general, being part of these conversations, actively engaging in them is something that we owe based upon the setup in which we operate. Um, and yeah. if we look at like our practical work, I guess the, the contract aspect is one thing, but then if you also look at our artwork, like we try to stay away from like visual stereotypical representations of like pyramids, belly dancing, even though we didn't do these. <laughs> um, um, but, um, and it continues in like the work of, that we do of like contextualizing the work, like trying to rather have the artist talk about his work instead of us necessarily talking about it. Um, totally. But yeah, okay. I mean, I think it's, it, and I, I think it's, a, it's, it's very, it's a very important aspect and in general, I really appreciate that there is much more of a conversation of, to be being had about your, how European or quote unquote Western labels deal with non-Western music. And I think it is very important that like the policies surrounding it, licensing approaches get critically questioned and publicly discussed, because I think that is the only way to establish workarounds that is better than what we probably had 10 years ago and therefore probably the workaround that we're going to have in 10 years will hopefully also be better um, than what we're having right now so i think it's, it's a pro process that is, is always evolving and is always in flux yeah okay we're going to open up to, to questions i agree with you by the way this could be an hour discussion that question alone uh, maybe we'll re revisit it another time. So Kwame, you're up first. If you want to put on your camera, go for it. Um, and please be brief with your question. Sure. Well, thank you, um, both Mikey and Giannis. Really, really appreciate uh, the time. And um, Giannis, just want to say, you know, the work that you guys have done to popularize forgotten music has just really, really been incredible. And, um, you know, I, 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 you see, I've, I've written something here in the chat. I've been reading this, this incredible piece by Simon Reynolds, uh, a great pop critic um, called Retromania, which deals with, you know, pop's kind of obsession with the past. And uh, in part, as I say here, what he deals with is how record labels, like, you know, we've got such incredible record labels these days that are dealing with, um, you know, revitalizing uh, sort of, uh, or and popularizing music from the past. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious because one of the things that this book raises is this, this point that in order to um, continue developing, it's, it's, it's important that every culture uh, go through a process of kind of moving beyond the past. And so I'm wondering, to what extent you and the team at Habibi Funk are thinking about the current scene and you know, um, popularizing, bringing to light some of the, the, the really interesting modern music. You know, and I, I just dropped the name of Maurice Luca, the, the Egyptian uh, kind of electronic musician as an example. Just curious to hear your thoughts. Great, thanks, Kwame. Uh, yeah, I mean, thank you. Um... I, I think I actually heard this album and I like it. Um, the, the thing is, and I think that is my super, and in this case, in, or in this sense, Habibi Funk is not different than Jakarta Records. Um, I always approached running a music label by the idea of putting out music that I personally really, really like. Um, and I'm not too strategic about it. Um, and I totally agree that there's tons and tons and tons of great contemporary music. Um, but from a personal standpoint, I've learned that I'm not that good at doing my job as a record label and as a, like an amplifier um, when 
I don't naturally connect with it. And I'm, I mean, more so on Jakarta Records, in the like 150 releases that that label has done, there, we have had a few where it felt more strategic, but it also always felt like the ones that, um, that are where we didn't do the best job. Um, and furthermore, I think also like the contemporary scene, like there is indie labels in Cairo, there is indie labels all over North Africa and West Asia. I don't think like the, the contemporary scene needs us. Um, I think there's enough people locally that do a 10 times better job than we, than what we could. Um, so um, I, I, there, there, there's a lot of stuff I like and um, you know, we also use our social media channel like Instagram a lot for like talking about stuff we like, but that we are not connected to. And there's also like contemporary DJs and artists and producers that we've tried to, to amplify, but I don't feel it, 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 I would, it makes any sense for us to necessarily go into like contemporary music, even though never say never, like I said, for me, the, it is heavily connected to me naturally connecting with music. And I wouldn't be surprised that eventually I come across this a contemporary band that I naturally connect with and Habibi Funk moves away from being just a racial label and actually putting out contemporary. Um, but yeah, cool. um, but in general, I think, um, especially like for, for, for like contemporary stuff, there's so many incredible uh, local collectives, labels, um, that um, I think, yeah, I don't think what, what we could bring to it is actually needed because it's tough. Okay, um, great. Our next question comes from Khaled. Hey, Yanis. Thanks, Mikey. Uh, hey, Yanis. Uh, really big fan of the music and the work that you've been putting out. Uh, my question was around, um, in some of the findings as you're crate digging, um, did you have any challenges around some of the quality of the recordings and the music that you were trying to re-release, um, whether it's like on the records or the masters or anything like that? And how did you address those challenges? Definitely. I mean, um, like for example, Roger's album um, and also Sam's album, they, they literally come from a cassette tape. A cassette tape that included dropouts of like three seconds and all of that. Um, I think it's always um, a compromise between realizing that maybe the only way how we can put this music out again is in uh, sound quality that might not meet the highest standards. But if the alternative is not being able to put it out, we usually settle for compromise. Having said that, um, the music we put out again, obviously we, we don't remix anything or we don't change the productions. It's one-on-one, -on -one the original recording. But what we do is we go through a, pro, a studio process. For example, if you have a vinyl record and that would be our source material and it has some stretches and therefore you have a tick every time the needle comes to this position again, you can get that tick out quite well. Um, or if like, let's say, the bass is a little too low or it, it, there's some high smithing. There's basically bits and pieces you can get done in a post-production, um, which we get done in, in, in the studio. And that is sometimes a very time intense um, process. Um, if let's say you have a very scratched up copy of vinyl, but this is, just happens to be the only one you have. Or sometimes that's a very easy process if you have a, like a nice clean master tape. Um, but yeah, no, no, I mean, we're definitely struggling with sound quality. For example, um, I'm really into reggae music from Libya. None of it was, or hardly any of it, apart from two records. There's no vinyl releases. It's all cassette tapes. Um, and the majority of the music you find is actually um, recordings of these cassette tapes that were done on bad cassette tape decks. So mm -hmm. it just sounds horrible. Um, and there's, there's tons of songs that I would say fully qualified to be reissued, but to this day, we have not found them in the sound quality that this could be considered. So we're looking for like original tapes, ideally not played too often because cassette tapes are a bit more fragile in terms of losing sound quality than vinyl. But yeah, that's definitely a challenge we have. Cool. And, and sorry, okay. last, last thing. And on top of that, a 
lot of the bands we deal with had had not necessarily the economic opportunities to go in a big fancy studio. So oftentimes the, the recording itself is already lo-fi and you might have only had like two mics in a room and, um, and not like two weeks of studio time, but just one day to record a whole album. So yeah. So um, thanks Yannis, thanks Khaled. If you're interested in connecting with Habibi Funk, uh, they're on all the social media platforms. You can check out their YouTube page and their band camp. Uh, there's a ton of stuff to dive into. You can also actually go get uh, the albums themselves. Um, Yannis, this is super fun. Um, thanks, for, thanks for making time to do this. Thank you for having me. I think there needs to be some sort of follow-up because there's so much music we didn't actually talk, talk through. Um, for those of you who are on the call, please give us feedback on how today went. Um, if you are not yet a supporter of Afikra, we are running a campaign to actually make sure that the work that we do is available to more and more people. Go to africa.com slash support. Uh, this recording will go up on our podcast and our YouTube page in a few days. Definitely make sure that you're subscribed to both of them. Tomorrow we have an event, Thursday we have an event, and we keep on going next week as well. So thanks to everybody who joined. I'm going to play a little bit of that Libyan reggae on the way out because I think that's my latest favorite. Okay, everybody. Bye, guys. See ya.